Hello, and welcome to another issue of our Reg Brief. This time, we're going to talk about everything that happened in the month of August. And boy, was it busy this time. Joining me to present our guidance, regulatory changes, and so forth is Shelby Montgomery. She's a regulatory compliance counsel and manager here at Incontracts. And we have Alicia Briley. She is a lending compliance expert with our group. And my name is Stephanie Lyon. I am the vice president of compliance at Incontracts. And we're going to go ahead and start with issues affecting the entire industry, then drill down in, into issues affecting depository institutions, banks, credit unions, and end with our mortgage companies. First up, we're going to talk about unfair, deceptive, abusive acts or practices, UDAP. You haven't gone all summer without hearing about something to do with UDAP. And this time around, the CFPB released a bulletin, a consumer bulletin that sought to answer the question whether if you had any security issues and deficiencies, could that be considered a deceptive practice under the UDAP framework? The too long didn't read version of their guidance is yes. But I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the analysis that the CFPB used to now link security deficiencies to deceptive acts and practices. So if you remember the deceptive prong, it has three main components to it. The first one is the act or practice has to have substantial injury or cost or is likely to cause substantial injury to a consumer. If you think about a data breach and losing confidential data, such as your social security number, where you live, your date of birth, all the information someone needs to open accounts on behalf of you, that can have a pretty severe impact on a consumer. All we have to do is think back about from Equifax and remember the 100 plus million consumers whose data was affected during that breach and remember how complicated and terrible that experience was for a lot of folks. A lot of us are still undergoing credit monitoring. Some of us had our identity stolen. A lot of us are still trying to get with our credit reporting agencies to say something is not accurate. So there are lasting effects to a data breach for consumers. So first prong, check. <laughs> what about the second prong? The second prong is the injury should not be easily avoidable by the consumer. Well, if you think about a data breach, again, in, in information security programs and protocols, your consumers have nothing to do with implementing controls. They have nothing to do with telling you to patch software. They don't even know if your CTO, your CISO, they're qualified individuals. The only one that really has control over your programs, your controls, the expertise on staff is your institution. So can the consumer reasonably avoid it? No. So there we go, check number two. Now we go to the third one, which is... The injury itself should not be outweighed by countervailing benefits to competition or to the consumer. The CFPB specifically said that they have not seen a single court determine that there is any benefit to a consumer from a data breach or from lack security controls. So there's really not a huge argument to be made there. If I was to put on my really creative thinking cap and say, what argument could I think of that competition or consumers are being benefited with, with lack of security controls? I could argue something like we're spending our funds in innovation, bringing in a new product or a new service, or uh, we're trying to give members or customers a lower rate. That's why we don't have as good cybersecurity as we should. That's not a good enough reason, because if you think about products or services or innovation, what do the regulators always say? They say you have to manage the risk, and cybersecurity is one of those primary risks. So the takeaway from the guidance is information technology is now tied to UDAP, and you need to do a couple of things. Number one, make sure you have multi-factor authentication. They call that out specifically. It's a way to protect the information and ensure only the right person can access the account. Number two, you want to make sure your password protections and password security is good to go. It's up to date. And number three, don't be like Equifax. Make sure you patch your known vulnerabilities because if you know about them, so do the hackers. So do everyone else that's nefarious. So make sure you in a timely manner, patch those up. So those are the main takeaways for this guidance. And we're going to go ahead and move on to the FHA, where Alicia is going to tell us a little bit about that agency and what they've been up to. 
So the Fair Housing Finance Agency, or FHFA, announced that Fannie and Freddie will start requiring servicers to obtain and maintain borrowers' fair lending data and have it in a format that's easily monitored and reportable. The data points include the borrower's race, age, ethnicity, gender, the borrower's preferred language, and that preferred language requirement is a follow-up from the announcement from the regulators earlier this year. The requirement will be effective for all mortgages originated on or after March 1st of 2023. However, servicers may implement this immediately and are encouraged by the agencies to get it going sooner rather than later. They also state that for any loans where servicing is transferred on or after March 1st and fair lending data was collected during the origination process, the servicer transferring the loan will have to provide those data points to the new servicer for the records too. Additionally, servicers may, but aren't required to update these data elements in the event of a future transfer of ownership or assumption of the mortgage. These new requirements regarding servicing and fair lending stems from the foreclosure crisis and is in response to the struggles with the COVID-19 world that we are currently living in now. The institution should be preparing for this requirement with policies, procedures, and within systems, and work closely with the lines of business and their LOS systems to ensure that the data is properly collected and maintained, especially since some lenders out there utilize different servicing systems or even utilize subservicers and may not have the capabilities currently to properly maintain this data. Next on the FHFA front is the announcement from HUD this month regarding the requirement for FHA lenders to obtain a unique entity identifier, or UEI for short. The UEI replaced the DUNS number earlier this year and is a 12-character alphanumeric ID assigned to the institution through SAM.gov. The purpose of this identifier is for agencies to be able to have a database on any non-federal entities that are doing business with the government. The feds began transitioning to this UEI requirement back in July of 2019, requiring all recipients of federal funding to obtain a unique identifier. This is also a similar concept to the Humda legal entity identifier, although the UEI is a few less digits to track. Institutions may implement this immediately, but it has to be in place no later than December 31st of 2022. This is a quick implementation date, and it's important to make sure that there's compliance tracking, incorporation of applicable lines of businesses, along with providing adequate training, monitoring, and testing too. Existing FHA lenders and mortgagees will need to provide a UEI as a part of their institution data in the LEAP portal. And FHA, lenders submitting for FHA approval will need to include this ID on their application as well. There's a link in the letter that institutions will use to get this UEI number. And as additional note, HUD is also accepting comments on this requirement and will consider any notes when looking at future updates. So if you have any, make sure you submit them. I know I provided a lot of info there, so I'll hand the mic back over to you, Steph. A lot of great information, Alicia. And now we're going to transition over to one of Shelby's favorite topics and states to talk about, and that is California and the CCPA. Shelby, take it away. Oh, yes, I do love California. So if you are subject to the California Consumer Privacy Act, more fondly known as the CCPA, then you know how strenuous the requirements are. But the California Attorney General may have finally given us a bit more insight this month with its announcement of the first public CCPA enforcement action. This is a settlement that is likely the first of many. Um, it's not against a financial institution. The action is actually against beauty retailer Sephora, and it's related to their online practices. So basically, Sephora uses a third party to track their consumers as they shop. This third party can tell Sephora um, whether or not one of their customers is using a MacBook or a Dell the brand of eyeliner the customer is um, shopping for, or even the location where the customer is. So the use of this third party info triggers obligations under the CCPA and Sephora allegedly failed to follow them. Among those allegations, Sephora did not disclose to customers that it was selling their personal information. 
They did not process user requests to opt out of the sale uh, via user-enabled global, global privacy controls. I'm going to keep referring to them as GPC. Now, if you don't know what GPC is, it's a browser setting that sends a signal to notify websites of a user's privacy preferences. Sephora also did not cure these violations within the short 30-day period that's currently allowed by the CCPA. They ended up with a $1.2 million penalty. Sephora is required to now clarify its online disclosures and privacy policy. They have to let customers know that they're selling their data. They have to provide opt-out me mechanisms, um, conform their service provider agreements to the CCPA's requirements, and then report to the Attorney General regarding their progress. So what can the rest of us take from this settlement? Well, we now know that the use of analytics, advertising cookies, and other automatic data collection technologies are considered a sale under the CCPA. The settlement also makes clear that although the GPC is not widely adopted, uh, the Attorney General is going to consider it mandatory to comply with. We found out that same day that the AG's office sent out additional notices to other businesses uh, alleging noncompliance with opt-out requests made via GPC. The settlement also tells us that the AG's office has been and will continue actively enforcing the CCPA. So what can you be doing? Well, if you're subject to the CCPA, you wanna do a number of things. Review the use of any cookies that could be a sale under the CCPA. Take a look at your privacy notices. Are they disclosing that you're selling personal information? Are they talking about any financial incentives or loyalty programs that you may offer? Are they clear and understandable to the average consumer? You want to also review your agreements with your third parties to make sure that they are compliant with the CCPA. And implement a do not sell my personal information link if you don't already have that. You want to ensure your websites recognize and properly process any GPC signal. Now, this, this topic has come up in the headlines of every article and blog that I've read on this enforcement action. It's a big one, so take note. Watch out for and respond to any notices from the AG's office alleging CCPA violations. Remember, short window of time there to respond, 30 days. And then on top of everything else, make sure you're ready for the changes that are coming under the California Privacy Rights Act or CPRA, because that's going to go into effect on January 1st of 2023. So lots to unpack there, but I hope lots of good information to help you as you continue your journey to CCPA compliance. That journey is never ending. <laughs> All right, let's move on to issues affecting our depository institutions. And we're going to start with interagency guidance or interagency actions pertaining to loan accommodations, I believe, right, Alicia? Yes, that's correct. Um, so this is an interesting topic, I think, because it outlines an area that doesn't really get a lot of focus in these reg updates like other areas do. But the OCC, FDIC, and NCUA issued a proposed policy statement and request for comment on prudent commercial or re commercial real estate or CRE loan accommodations and workouts, which was first adopted back in 2009. And this update is meant to build on that existing guidance that was out there. The agencies also consulted with state bank and credit union regulators during the creation of this too. And the key word of this policy statement is prudent. It is all over the place in their guidance letters and statements. There are three areas changing, including a new section on short-term loan accommodations, along with information about the changes in accounting principles that have happened since that 2009, and revisions of it, um, and additions to examples of the CRE loan workouts. There is also emphasis on the importance of working constructively with borrowers who are facing financial difficulties, which can benefit both the borrowers and the institution too. And to, Discuss the supervisory expectations regarding that CRA loan accommodation or workouts process. And this will remain consistent with the safety and soundness standards under the interagency guidelines. It also addresses several components around prudent risk management practices and elements for accommodation and workouts. I'll also add that there's six appendices documented in the statement. So make sure if you haven't read through that, you do, because there's a lot of good information in there. 
And the expanded examples, I think, provide can be pretty helpful to institutions since it covers a range of loan modification strategies, loan purposes, collateral, and well-defined loan weaknesses. So it's a good starting point for policies, procedures, and then just overall training aspects that you could provide. Basically, the intention with this interagency statement is to promote supervisory consistency among examiners, enhance the transparency of the CRA, CRE, not CRA, CRE, loan accommodations and workout arrangements, and ensure that supervisory policies and actions do not inadvertently limit the availability of credit to sound borrowers. The agencies acknowledge that financial institutions are facing significant challenges when working with these CRE borrowers who are experiencing financial hardship, and that many of these borrowers are still credit worthy and want to pay back the debts that they owe, but they might just need a little assistance. Examiners are expected to take a balanced approach too when assessing the institution's risk management practices for loan accommodation and workout activities, and to make sure it's adequate. It's critical that institutions maintain accurate reports to show their financial position and risk profiles too. The agencies are looking from co for comments from institutions on this policy statement, all the information that's provided in there, which are due by October 3rd. So make sure to check out the policy statement because there's five questions in there that can help get you started. Thank you, Alicia. All right, let's move on to requests for information. This is when the regulators get together and ask the industry for their thoughts, which is kind of nice. Um, and this time, they want to know about the FFIC's cybersecurity assessment tool, or the CAT. The CAT is a tool that's been around for a few years now and our examiners all of them have been using it to determine the level of readiness cybersecurity readiness of financial institutions so we know that there has been some rumblings about this tool being replaced updated changed uh, we even have heard in the field that the OCC is potentially developing their own tool that is going to be utilized by their examiners. And we do have reason to believe that they are developing it, but there's nothing out there to find regarding this tool yet. So don't be out there looking for the OCC specific version of the CAD because it's not something that has been actually published by them. So the information request itself is very bare. It's poorly written, to be quite honest with you, so I wouldn't waste a lot of time going through it, but if you have comments regarding the, the way that the information is collected in the CAD, if you have rumblings with that tool itself, this is a good time to let the agencies know. Another thing to know is two main highlights from the guidances or the notice that the tool itself, the CAT tool is voluntary. You don't actually have to use it if you have something better out there, a framework that is more closely aligned to ISO standards, NIST, anything like that, you can go ahead and rely on that, but you still have to make sure you're meeting baseline cybersecurity preparedness or remember, lack of security controls could be a UDAP. So that's even more important to note nowadays. The other thing to note is something that they highlighted on the notice. Apparently the industry comments in the past have said, hey, we want more guidance for our senior executives, for the board of directors. And the agencies wanted to remind us as an industry that that's already out there. They have instructions on how to use the CAT. They have documents specifically crafted for your senior executives and board of directors that might need to be taught a different way. And so you can find that on the FFIEC's website as is. We're gonna go ahead and move on to the Federal Reserve, which uh, Alicia was talking about earlier with the uh, loan accommodations, they were not part of that guidance. So we are going to focus on what did the Fed do when they weren't working with the other agencies on that other notice and information. And instead, it looks like they're talking about their payment service, their payment services. So Shelby, why don't you tell us about it? Yeah, so the Federal Reserve Board has issued some final guidelines for the 12 reserve banks to use when reviewing requests for access to uh, Federal Reserve Master Accounts and Payment Services, just as you said, Stephanie. Uh, master Account and Federal Reserve Services allow institutions to transfer money to other master account holders directly. Uh, so it's important because if you have to use a third party, this can add cost and delay and further complications to your transactions. Now, these guidelines come at a time when institutions with non-traditional types of banking charters are increasingly requesting access to 
to Reserve Bank Services. So let's talk about what the guidelines do. Well, they make the application process more transparent by describing the risk factors that each Reserve Bank should take into consideration when uh, looking at an application. They also establish a three-tier approach regarding the intensity of a Reserve Bank's review. So let's talk about now some key takeaways. Many novel charters are still ineligible. You still have to meet the definition of a depository institution under the Federal Reserve Act or be specifically eligible under some other statute to apply for a master account. When talking more about the three tiers of review, we know the more traditional the charter, the closer the entity is to direct supervision by the Federal Reserve, the more streamlined the easier a reserve bank's review is expected to be. Now, the more risk your entity presents, the more rigorous the review. Uh, the guidelines also have six principles that provide a risk management framework for the reserve banks to apply, and uh, they indicate that an implementation plan will follow. Now, there are some things that the guidelines don't do, and there are lots of questions remaining. There's still no timeline for the reserve banks to act on a request. There's still no answer to the ongoing debate about eligibility, and this is significant to some of you out there, maybe who uh, can become or are eligible to become an insured depository institution, but you choose not to do so. You can still apply, but with the discretion these guidelines still allow the reserve banks, they, they may not grant you access. So still a, a lingering question out there about that. There's also no clear path forward for those entities that lack federal bank supervision, including those novel charter types that we talked about before. So these guidelines, they're not necessarily transformative, but they give us a little more light on the matter. Uh, the FRB is aware that there's still more work to do, and we'll keep following this one. Thank you, Shelby. I love guidance. That's not very clear. <laughs> All right, we're going to go ahead and move on to issues affecting our banks. And we're going to start with a conversation on a hot summer topic, which is cryptocurrency. Alicia, take it away. Cryptocurrency is, is that's correct, Steph. Cryptocurrency continues to be a hot topic. And since it's still newer and it's continuing to evolve throughout our industry, especially, um, there's a lot of uh, parameters and dots that need to be connected. The Federal Reserve Board provided additional information for banks that they supervise and that and that are engaging in crypto asset related activities. And although there are benefits and opportunities, there's also a lot of challenges and risks that must be considered too. For example, addressing safety and soundness issues, technology issues, and one of the most important parts is monitoring and protecting against anti-money or monitoring and protecting against money laundering since cryptocurrency is still a bit hard to track properly. The FRB letter outlines the steps that any banks they supervise should take before engaging in any crypto asset related activities. For example, assessing whether or not the activities are legally permissible and determining whether any regulatory filings are required. Based on one of the statements in the letter, FRB banks should be notifying their lead FRB supervisor, and if state regulated to, they should be notifying them as well. The supervisory letter is on the heels of the interagency statement that was published last year, and the guidance that the OCC and the FDIC published for their supervised institutions too. And it is important to make sure that adequate systems, including risk management and controls are in place, and that they are completed in a safe and sound and con manner consistent with all applicable laws, especially consumer protection, because we know how big fair lending and consumer protection laws are in the regulator's eyes right now. Keep a close eye on this area, though, if your institution is participating or will be participating in these activities, because this month, Congress also is pushing the OCC to rescind and revise their cryptocurrency guidance to be more comprehensive. So we might still see some big changes coming down the pipeline for this. Fun stuff, right? Definitely fun. <laughs> so we're going to go ahead and move on. The, the Federal Reserve Board, the FRB, has been very busy. Shelby talked about it. Alicia talked about it. And we have one more thing to talk about regarding the Federal Reserve, and that is an enforcement action against a bank in Maryland that cost them $95 million. So what did this bank do? Well, 
there were three main issues with this institution, but it was all around violations for the insider lending reg, which is regulation O. Regulation O has been around for a very long time. It's there as a safety and soundness mechanism to ensure that people that have a lot of pool, your insiders like CEOs, board members, they're not getting away with getting loans at better rates, better terms, or underwriting criteria that is not otherwise available for all of your customers or your members. So what happened here with this institution, the then CEO was allowed to get about almost $100 million worth of loans when he was the president of that institution. And most of these loans did not go through any of the majority of the board of directors for voting. So that's the first violation. It's a very clear regulation O issue. The second issue we had here is their internal control structure. For a lot of the loans that the CEO himself wanted to obtain through either family trust or other companies that he himself controlled, he was allowed to have conversations regarding the underwriting with the loan officers. So talk about a major conflict of interest where he was definitely gaining from these conversations and was able to get those loans approved. So that was a major issue. Because the CEO was, I'm sure, very blatant about these violations, uh, he did, in fact, get barred from being able to participate in banking activities, and he will have to pay a $9,000 uh, $9, fine, $90,000 fine. It's very insignificant if you think about $90 mil $95 million to the bank, uh, $100 million in loans, and the CEO only has to pay about $90,000 for these violations. So that's where we ended with the lending issues. Now we still have the third main issue with that institution, and that is a vendor management oversight problem. Apparently, they also entered into an agreement with a DC council member. So we're talking a politician here, where the politician was going to be providing and rendering services. The bank did go ahead and remit some kind of fee to that DC council member, but the Federal Reserve could not ascertain what, if any, services were going to be rendered by these the DC politicians. So you can go ahead and read between the lines if you want, but they didn't want to go as far as calling it anything too nefarious. They went ahead and said it was a vendor management issue and deficiency. So this bank has had quite a bit of issues lately. So it's not just the precedent of the institution that has now been barred from the banking business. A few years ago, their chief lending officer was also barred from partaking in the banking industry. So this tells you a couple of things about this institution that we can take back ourselves. Number one, culture of compliance and culture of risk management is essential. If you don't have people at the top, whether it's your board members, your senior management, believing in that separation of duties, ensuring you have the appropriate internal controls to prevent this, you don't have whistleblowers out there saying, hey, there's something really wrong going on, you have a severe problem when it comes to following the rules and your culture of compliance. So you need to strengthen that. The second issue here is you probably could have been able to uncover this much earlier if you had done a comprehensive regulation O audit or internal testing. Again, the way they could have done it, they may have done it, they didn't do it. Whatever the case might be, it took a regulator to go after them for them to decide to correct these issues. And so as an institution out there, just know that regulation O is being overseen by the Fed pretty strongly right now, not that long ago. Earlier this summer, they did go ahead and update their frequently asked questions regarding Reg O compliance. So it's clear to me they're sending us a signal that they're paying a lot of attention in insider lending. So make sure your institution is also giving it some love and attention during the summer months. All right, let's move on to the last point here for our banks, and that's going to be FDIC guidance. Finally, someone else other than the Fed. Yeah, so in last month's Reg Brief, we talked about the New York Department of Financial Services and their guidance on overdraft and NSF fees. And this month, we're seeing the same from the FDIC. So following its identification of a number of UDAT violations during consumer compliance examinations, the FDIC is now issuing supervisory guidance to warn supervised institutions that charging multiple NSF fees on represented 
unpaid transactions may open the door for increased risk and regulatory scrutiny. So this guidance discusses three categories of risk. It talks about consumer compliance risk, third party risk and litigation risk. It also describes risk mitigation practices that your bank can take to reduce consumer harm and avoid violations. And among those are a comprehensive policy and procedures re review, um, ensuring your disclosures related to NSF fees are again clear and conspicuous, and then also reviewing your customer notification practices. We want to ensure our customers have the abil ability to avoid multiple fees if they can. Now, this guidance also discusses the supervisory approach the FDIC will take when recognizing a bank's efforts to proactively self-identify and correct violations. So, as always, I encourage you to review all of your practices and disclosures uh, and fully consider the mitigation practices that are laid out here in the guidance. Now, it's important to note that this guidance directly applies only to state chartered banks that are not members of the Federal Reserve System. And while neither the OCC, the FRB, nor the CFPB have taken a formal public position on representment NSF fees, we all know when it comes to consumer compliance issues, the regulators generally take the same approach. And considering overdraft practices are a current a focus at both the state and federal levels, I'm going to go out on a limb here. I'm going to predict that these agencies will all take a similar position, either in guidance or otherwise, sometime in the very near future. It's a very sound prediction, Shelby. All right, let's go ahead and talk about our credit unions. The regulator themselves was in a little bit of a break, it seemed like, but they're giving away some money, right, Shelby? Yeah, they are. So the NCUA announced that it will pay credit unions $395 million in September from the remainders of four corporate credit unions that it liquidated in 2010. So the NCUA as liquidating agent, it will distribute $313 million to more than 400 members and paid in capital shareholders of the former members United, Constitution, and U.S. Central Corporate Credit Unions, and it will also distribute $82 million in dividends to more than 1,100 shareholders of Southwest Corporate. These distributions are the product of the NCUA's Corporate System Resolution Program, which was established years ago to stabilize, resolve, and reform the corporate credit union system in the wake of the 2008 financial crisis. The distributions are scheduled to occur by September 30th, this is the fifth distribution and the NCUA will have returned more than $2.6 billion to former members and paid in capital shareholders and almost $292 million in dividends to shareholders. Now, Chairman Harper has said this is another milestone in the winding down um, of this program. The program itself has not been without its critics and the NCUA has anticipated your questions. So there are updated FAQs on these payouts and that may prove to be a helpful resource for you if you're interested. I am interested. I'm hoping I'll get a check. I'm just <laughs> All right, let's move on to issues affecting our mortgage companies. We're going to start with cybersecurity yet again. I can't stop, won't stop. All right, so the CSBS, which is the Conference of State Bank Supervision, they are generally a, a group of folks that get together to give us standards and helpful um, information for state specific institutions. So what did they do now? They released two new cybersecurity assessment tools. So we're talking about the cybersecurity assessment tools for banks. Now we're talking about cybersecurity assessment um, tools for non-bank entities. There are two of them. The first one is for small, less complex institutions. And the second one is to be used by examiners for larger, more complex institutions. So it's generally a fantastic idea to go ahead and take the tools given to the examiners and use them for yourself to make sure before the examiner shows up to your institution, you know what your gaps are, you know if you have issues, you know if you're not meeting cybersecurity readiness or preparedness or any, again, like gaps, like I mentioned, any security per, uh, controls that are not as effective as you thought, this is the time to do that review internally so that you can go ahead and do proactive corrections and make that a little bit stronger by the time your examiners show up. 
There are a couple of other really phenomenal tools in the CSBS's pockets. They also have a ransomware, ransomware self-assessment tool. This would tell you if you are a potential for ransomware or how well you would stand that kind of attack. And the second one is a cybersecurity 101 guide that is targeted for board members and senior executives. So again, anytime you have to start spending some money in cybersecurity, you're going to want to educate your board, educate senior management to make sure that they're giving you the resources you need to protect your institutions because the banking industry and the financial sector is heavily targeted by hackers. So we do have to spend here to make sure we get ahead. All right, let's go ahead and move on to major mortgage company settlements. And I'm going to give it over to my colleagues. Yep. First up, we've got a state that's close to your heart, Stephanie, Massachusetts. Uh, I don't think we talk about it often, but we finally, we finally will this month. Maybe not for good reasons, but uh, Massachusetts has an act preventing unlawful and unnecessary foreclosures, also known as 35B. And this act requires mortgage servicers to make a good faith effort to prevent unnecessary, unnecessary foreclosures and keep families in their homes. Now, in a recent settlement with the state's attorney general, it became clear that one mortgage servicer was doing anything but. Um, and this servicer is alleged to have failed to take in the required steps to help homeowners avoid foreclosure harassed consumers with excessive debt collection calls. They failed to inform their borrowers of their right to request a verification of the amount of their debt. And finally, in some instances, they unfairly charged foreclosure related fees before obtaining the authority to foreclose. Now, this servicer denied all the allegations, of course, but agreed to provide affected homeowners with $2.7 million in direct relief. And this is to come in the form of principal forgiveness for eligible loans. Uh, the servicer will also pay $500,000 to the state. And they also agreed to make significant changes to their practices and procedures. So the Massachusetts Attorney General considers, considers itself to be a national leader in, in recent years in securing relief for borrowers and homeowners from bad acting mortgage lenders and servicers. So if you're in the industry in that state, take notes, learn from the mistakes of others and do the right thing. And if you're in Massachusetts, let me know and I'll come say hi. All right, moving on, we do have our last topic here and it is appraisal bias. While we're talking about it in mortgage companies, appraisal bias really affects the entire lending institutions and, and industry. So Alicia is going to break it down for us with what's going on on that front. Yep. So you may have heard in previous red briefs that we put out about the PAVE task force for appraisals that was instituted by President Biden and other lawsuits against other lenders around appraisal bias. It's still continuing now. This topic isn't going away, especially considering the heavy focus in expansion of fair lending and other consumer protection laws, too. Recently, though, a Maryland couple has sued an appraisal firm and their lender, alleging that the appraisal they received on their home was unfairly low due to their race, which is a violation of both fair housing, the Fair Housing Act and other lending laws. This is after obtaining a second appraisal with a new lender that was almost $300,000 higher. That's crazy that it's that much of a difference. The complaint alleged that the appraiser cherry-picked low-value homes in majority Black communities as the comps that was used and ignored most, more closely related and nearby sales that held higher values and were in majority white areas and were also actually closer in relation to the couple's home. Additionally, when the couple approached the loan officer claiming that the value was impacted by racial bias, they were instructed to submit an explanation of why they felt their appraisal was impacted and were told that they had 10 days to do so, even though it came out later that they actually had 60 days to submit that explanation. But after the submission of the letter, the loan officer and the lender stopped responding to the couple and their loan was denied due to the reliance on the flawed appraisal. And this is all according to the complaint that was submitted during the lawsuit. A few months after their loan was denied, the couple applied for a loan with a different lender and also performed an experiment of whitewashing their home, which means they removed any indication that a Black family lived there and they had a white colleague present when the appraiser was there. 
There were no significant improvements to the property in the months between appraisals. Um, the market was still pretty considerable um, in regards to value. And the appraisal came back almost 60% higher than the initial appraisal with the other lender. This goes further than just the appraisal bias too here, because although they were approved and received a higher value, they were also negatively impacted due to receiving a higher rate and having to pay it down with points. So there's multiple impacts there just because of the one the, that one appraisal bias issue. It's important for institutions to remember and be conscious about appraisals. Even though your institution isn't completing them, um, you're still liable for them as well. You should have monitoring in place and incorporate reviews into your fair lending testing too here. Also make sure to monitor complaints received and ensure that they are adequately addressed and not ignored. Another takeaway is to make sure appropriate staff, especially loan officers, know how to handle these instances and what to look for themselves in order to better protect your borrowers and your institution. Those are great tips, Alicia. And don't forget, if you are checking out our website, we also have more tips on how to prevent loan bias and appraisal bias at your institution. So search for that blog. All right. On behalf of Shelby Montgomery, on behalf of my colleague, Alicia Briley, and myself, we thank you for your attention. I know we had a lot to cover this time. If you need any more information on the guidance, the reg changes, the enforcement actions, we have it in N compliance. So check it out, and we'll see you back next month. Thank you.